Hello. It is working, I believe. How is everybody? Everybody good? Food good? Yeah? What's your favorite food? Favorite food? Burgers? Pastel donatas? The pastel donatas were good, weren't they? All right? Um, all right. This is my field of speech. I will stay here. Um, yeah, my name is Jack. I'm an engineering manager at a company called Multiverse. And I am here today to talk to you about our journey from a small startup to a unicorn business and the engineering team within that. So to do that, I want to talk about, first of all, very briefly, what is a unicorn? So a unicorn is any privately held company that's worth more than a billion dollars, right? Um, and the reason it's called a unicorn is because it's very similar in terms of uh, probability to finding a unicorn in the wild. In fact, the difference between the 0% chance of finding a unicorn and a startup is 0.0006%. So... It's pretty unique, it's pretty awesome, it's a pretty great place to work. So what we're gonna be talking about today is how we built our team around Elixir and the kind of challenges we faced going through that. Should I get my notes back up on my screen? So, um, yeah, I'm not here to talk about the business side of things. It's gonna be more about the tech and the team that we built. But to start with, um, I wonder, does anybody know what Multiverse does? So, first, hands up. If you think we're in the virtual reality space, anybody, anybody at all? One person, two people, three people, amazing. How about healthcare testing, blood tests, and that kind of stuff? Anybody think we're in there? One person, two people. What about apprenticeships and digital skills and learning? Hey, we've got some hands. Nice, cool, okay. And what about visual effects processing? One or two people, three people, four people, five people. So Multiverse is actually, we're a learning company and we're trying to build the next generation um, of future leaders through professional apprenticeships. Um, so um, what that means is that we help people learn and earn as software engineers, data analysts, and more, a whole bunch of awesome companies, such as the ones that are here on our lovely uh, award-winning marketing sites. Um, but for almost a decade, we've kind of grown our team rapidly through evolving our operational processes and building tools alongside them. Now, as we want to grow our scale, so so far we've helped 10,000 people gain new skills, complete apprenticeships, get career-changing jobs through this. We need to become more of a tech-focused company. And over the last kind of two years, we've been scaling our team from 10 engineers to a team of now of more than 60. So, isn't this Elixir Conf, I hear you saying? What has this got to do with Elixir? That's the elephant in the room, right? So, <laughs> everyone's kind of sat here wondering, who's this guy talking to me about engineering management and unicorns and all this kind of crap, right? Um, apologies if I swear throughout this, I'm English and I tend to do that. Um, so, Elixir's, uh, sorry, Multiverse's platform is an Elixir application. We use Phoenix and Phoenix Live View for our web application. We use OBAN for asynchronous jobs. We use Broadway to manage asynchronous processing uh, between systems. We've used Absinthe for GraphQL. We've used Fun with Flags for feature flagging. If there's a, a, language, if there's a, a library in the Elixir ecosystem, it's probably there uh, in our dependencies. We're fully bought in. Now, building a team of this size in that time frame um, poses a challenge to any team. So. I want to give the specifics of what challenges we faced doing this with Elixir at its core. So, first of all, let's set the scene. We're going to go back in time to 2021. Uh, if you feel like humoring me at this point, you can close your eyes and imagine. To take you back to a time when El Internet Explorer was still a year away from its end of life and developers everywhere were counting down the days. Italy had just beaten England in the Euro 2020 final, even though it was 2021. Remember that time? Phoenix uh, was just a month away from implementing the Heeks formatting em uh, engine, and I had just left a job at IBM to join a fast-growing startup. I wanted to work where the company's mission aligned to my values, and I wanted to work somewhere where I could expand my horizons from a programming language point of view. Previously, I'd been a JavaScript consultant, uh, and I wanted to learn a new language, functional language, and get more into the back-end space. I also wanted to get more involved in running a real engineering team, hiring, product management, uh, and getting a team to work effectively with the business. This was why I joined Multiverse. And this is what Multiverse looked like when I joined in 2021. Uh, so there were 
10 engineers, roughly, two cross-functional teams. We had small but mighty products and design functions and just one engineering manager, Theo, who's been my mentor over the last two years and who this talk couldn't be, uh, couldn't be possible with uh, without for today. So Theo and our VP of products, Emma, had already kind of started on this journey of hyper growth. And we faced three main challenges we're gonna talk about today. So the first one was recruitment. How do we hire enough of the right people? The second one is retention, if the clicker will work. How could we make Multiverse the best place to work for people when we've got there? And thirdly, how could we work together to make a meaningful change? Finally, is how do we do this while doing that in the, the kind of the context of Elixir? So first off, I want to talk about recruitment and start with a little bit of audience participation because I know we're a little bit sleepy after that big lunch. Is there anybody in here who's just started learning Elixir recently? One or two people, awesome. You're in the right place. It's the right conference for you. Next, hands up if you've been using Elixir for more than one year. Cool, everybody. I keep your hands up if it's been more than two years. Four years? Six years? 10 years? Ah, uh, Jose's not in the room, that's a shame. Um, awesome. So. One final question, who in here wants to move jobs? One person, and a lot of other people who are here with their colleagues from work. <laughs> um, fantastic, um, if, if those silent people are interested, as with every other company here, we are hiring. So come and talk to me at the end, or reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, I've gotta pay for my flights somehow. Um, so anyway, um, we're probably the most concentrated population of Elixir engineers in the world right now. Um, so having that many people here is not representative of the engineering population in general. Unfortunately, that's a tough fact. And it's a tough fact that as engineering managers looking to hire people into our team, we had to face. Um, and to face that, I'm gonna kind of show us some data. Now, this is not a perfect uh, kind of metric, but there's something called the TIOB index or TIOB or however you're meant to pronounce this. Does anyone know how to pronounce that? Is, or is it just an acronym that you just kind of get on with? So the TIOB index looks at the number of search queries that people are making against keywords related to a programming language and the number of results that come back and how content and interest grows over time to kind of rate languages. So here we can see Elixir's growth over the last couple of years. Its popularity's grown, we had a little bit of a dip, but now we're starting to plateau off and start to grow again. This actually really closely represents something called the Gartner hype curve, if anyone's familiar with that, often used for technologies and things like that. Um, we talk about the peak of inflated expectations as everyone thinks it's gonna solve all of the world's problems. And then people find, start to find the limits, start to find how to work with it. Interest drops off slightly, and then we start to get into a plateau of productivity where the real work begins and we start to make meaningful change. And that's awesome that that's where the Elixir community is today. We're in that meaningful change period, so let's keep going. So next, I'm gonna throw up another one, and I've just chosen Java as an example, right? Now, Java's popularity has had a big peak, but it's declined for the last decade or so. But I've kind of pulled an apple here, and I've shown you some charts with some nice lines and not much in the terms of, uh, of scale and putting them next to each other. So let's put these next to each other. <laughs> so if you can't see that at home, uh, Elixir is not the x-axis, uh, it is down there, and that's, that's a shame, right? And that's why we're here today, right? To, to try and change that and to try and bring its popularity up. But where Java has a declining, a big population and a declining popularity, we have a small population and an increasing popularity. And what that means for us and Multiverse was when we were looking to scale our team to 60, uh, 60 people and more in the future, we looked to hire generalists. So to talk about what that is, let's take a look at this little Venn diagram here. In blue, we've got the people who wanna move jobs. Green, we've got the people who already know the language. And in purple, we have the, the population of people that might wanna learn Java. So this is a representative example. It's not, it's not to scale or anything like that right now. And what that means is that you have two hiring pools. You have specialists who already know the language, the people in the green and the blue, and generalists, people who have the propensity to learn and people who want to move jobs, but have that training gap that they have to get through. In the Elixir world, it looks more like this, right? We've got a great community, really great interest in the market. Um, I think um, Savannah showed earlier the, the kind of the GitHub stats um, of, of like the interest in Phoenix and LiveView and things like that. We're growing and it's awesome. 
However, fewer people know about us and know it already. And what that means is we have to go for this purple and blue spot over there on the right here. We have to think about hiring generalists. But obviously, we'll take those specialists where they can come from. Um, so yeah, um, we do that where we can. Around about 90% of our hires at Multiverse have been in this generalists um, uh, uh, kind of band. What that means for us as engineering managers, we're engineers at heart, so we like to model things as systems. Uh, this is a, uh, a diagram ad adapted from Systems of Engineering Management, which is a book by Will Larson, uh, who you might have heard of. Um, essentially, we have two strategies to get to trained engineers who can have impact for our business, right? We can either hire specialists who are pretty quickly turned into trained engineers and they can have impact, or we hire new engineers. They need budget, they need time, and they need support. So, um, the other thing that we've done at Multiverse, right, is that we've looked to hire people from non-traditional backgrounds themselves. Some of that is through apprentices. We have an apprentice in each of our teams, or we used to until they complete their apprenticeships and then they just come full-time junior software engineers, and we have to try and keep up with that. Um, but we also have civil engineers, break dancers, teachers, um, <laughs> you name it. There's a, there's a whole host of people working in our engineering teams who aren't traditional computer science graduates. I'm just gonna find back my place in my notes here. Um, so the second thing we've done is to embrace hybrid and remote working as part of our growth. So previously, we only had people in London. Uh, we only had people in uh, our London offices. And what that meant was like extending this Venn diagram, there's a much smaller group of people than just shown here that actually live near your office, right? So what that means is that if you only choose those people who are near your office, you've suddenly got this tiny little orange speck on the chart of what you can hire if you're not hiring those hybrid and remote people. But equally, right, there's people in the world who want to work in an office. I wanted to. I was a young person living in London. I was living in London for the social side of things, and work is a huge part of that social life. So what we've done at Multiverse is embraced hybrid. You can work where you want to within the UK. Unfortunately, not within anywhere else right now other than the US. Um, but what that means is we can open up to this much bigger hiring pool and increase our chances even more so. The third thing we've done is to try and trust our team as much as possible. If, if you have got a job at a company, you've got through that interview process, the odds are you've got the skills to interview for it if you get the support from, from the people around you to grow those skills. Um, pairing on interviews, it reduces bias by getting two independent opinions as you go through. It also helps break the interview into a more natural conversation as you're chatting to people and helps scale your impact as a team as you grow new interviewers. There's a, a really great book by a doctor called Adam Kay, which is called This Is Going To Hurt, and it kind of talks about this classic thing in medical uh, training where they do see one, uh, see one, do one, teach one. This idea of scaling the impact of teams by showing people how to do things, trusting them to, to do it under supervision, and then trusting them to go on and spread that impact later on. Interviews and coding is the most effective way to scale a team. You see that here. We have more interviewers, our hiring rate increases, and there's more trained engineers who are helping us have that impact in society that we want to have as a company. So our second challenge of retention, how do we make our company the best place to work, right? Um, and part of that comes into that budget, time, and support that we need to make sure that those new engineers turn into trained engineers who are motivated at work and fulfilled in the work that they're doing but also it means minimizing that departure. The first thing we've been doing is making space and making time. First of all, in learning content. There's some amazing content out there in the Elixir ecosystem. Some of it is getting a little bit old. Some of the best stuff that I learned when I was learning was the Stephen Gritter course on Complete X, Elixir, and Phoenix. But you get halfway through the Phoenix part of it and it's broken. <laughs> but the Elixir part is amazing for teaching you the fundamentals. Also, the Pragmatic Studio is great guided stuff and exorcism is great for learning the fundamental syntax of the language. But we found there's been a gap, um, and there's been a gap in our community content around opinionated stuff. Elixir is a super flexible language, and our documentation around APIs and how to use stuff is phenomenal, but occasionally what our juniors have been telling us that it's really hard to know. Um, interesting, loud noises in the room, excuse me. Um, it's really hard to find opinionated stuff on how to structure uh, Phoenix contexts well, um, how, to, how to manage change sets without introducing, uh, without introducing vulnerabilities in your code while sharing those change sets. Um, to solve that, 
we've got people here today. We've got Caroline and Tim who are also here from Multiverse who are going to be telling you about our journey through that. We're also starting to publish stuff on our blog. Uh, and one of our senior engineers, uh, sorry, lead engineers, staff engineers, Chris, um, uh, is writing a, a book on, on his experience building a few little mini startups with LiveView alongside our product work. Also, I wanted to thank the people at Fly.io for the Phoenix Files and all of their amazing content there that's really helped us. The next thing is around making space and time with management. We, I mean, it's kind of very vanilla content, right? But one-to-ones should be should be a given in any engineering uh, in any engineering organization. But often, like tests, <laughs> they're the first thing that goes out of the window for some people when you get under pressure. We've always prioritized that so that all of our new people who are getting that training, that budget, that support to get them into trained engineers uh, have that every week, at least for 45 minutes. Second is to create a culture of feedback and collect data, but also to automate with humanity. So as we're onboarding new engineers, there's lots of things that get in their way. We've been trying to understand what those are, but also understand where we can improve them. Things like running uh, environment setup scripts is great. Reduces the amount of time that someone who joins needs to spend getting their laptop set up with Erlang and ASDF and Elixir and Docker and Postgres and all of these things with each of them with RabbitMQ that have all of these little niche things that can take a few hours to debug and on your first day, that's not the best look. We automate those things, but then things like product work th walkthroughs, architectural walkthroughs, things that we could just record a video and put away we don't. And the reason for that, it's there if they want it to go back to, but having that hum human side of things makes it such a good place to work. Finally, documentation, documentation, documentation. Um, some of the engineers that I, wo I work with, I've had some very passionate debates with about documentation. Um, some people believe that um, the best code is self-documenting, right? And that's great until you get to code bases of thousands of files and you have to read those thousands of files to know what's there to start with. At some point, a team scales most effectively by documentation, and that also reduces pressure on those original people um, who you have to look after. Talking about that, pairing is key. We mentioned this before, see one, do one, teach one. When forming new teams, think about tenure in the, the, the mix that you kind of split those teams about so that you have those experienced people there who less experienced people can feed off of. That doesn't just mean senior engineers, junior engineers, mid-engineers, but also how long have they been there at the company? What connections do they have within the company to know the underlying domain? Secondly, that creates pressure on those tenured engineers, and you have to make sure that there's the support there so they don't feel overwhelmed. Team forming as it itself in terms of splitting teams, creating new teams from scratch, taking a seed team from one place and then growing new people around them is a whole talk in itself, so I won't go into it too much here. Overall, right, what I've talked about there isn't revolutionary, right? It's learning on the job around structured real world problems um, with support from coaches um, and support from experienced people who know what they're doing. Also, space for self directed learning and the access to the best content there is. If only there was a company that did that for a living for everybody on the planet if they wanted to. That's multiverse. The final thing that we've done is plan for the future. As we were hiring from like 10 people to 60 people, that sounds like an unstructured mess and it sounds like a, a number that we just wanna hit that's arbitrary. Now it wasn't arbitrary. What the team, Theo and Emma and others did, even before I had arrived, was looking at what do we think is the best prototype of the team that balances seniority with room for growth, with career opportunities, uh, with cross-functional collaboration between product and design, and data-focused um, uh, data focused product leadership using user research. Taking that as the basis, we then looked at what the problem says is we want to solve. We want to have the best experience for people who are applying for apprenticeships. We want to have the best experience while they're on program. And we want to make sure that the companies that we're serving have the best, uh, have the best experience and know what their apprentices are doing, where their money that they're spending on this training is going. We formed domains around those problems and put in support for those domains and then support for that support as well when we got to the right stage with those 60 engineers. By planning for the future and planning our hiring over that, modeling it over time, it's exactly the same as what we do in software systems, right? 
we think about migrations, we think about target state architecture, but we can't just do a big bang migration. You have to think about strangler patterns. You have to think about evo evolution over time. And rarely do you get to the end and the system that you've built is the same thing that you built, that you designed in TL Draw or Excalibur Draw or whatever at the start. So you've got to evolve it over time. The final thing I want to talk about is how do we, while building this team, right? The idea of this team is that we can serve apprentices better. We can offer a better standard of learning. We can take more apprentices through. We can help our coaches who are giving that one-to-one -one, uh, tuition. We can, we can help them deliver the best standard of education possible. So growth for the sake of growth is one thing. Doing it while still building stuff, still like sustaining our growth is, uh, is super important. The first thing that we did, other than taking a sip of water because my mouth's going dry, was to align around goals and not requirements. Now, what do I mean by this? Who, who in here has had a message from a product owner, a product manager, saying, we need to build this feature? We need this feature. Why do we need this feature? You ask, because we need it, and I've promised it. <laughs> That's not what we do at Multiverse, um, thankfully. We set OKRs. Has anybody heard about OKRs? Anyone read any of it, any literature about it? Awesome. So we've got some good hands in the room, right? So for those who haven't, an OKR is an objective with key results. And they're pretty simple sentences, but they set a really clear goal. I'm going to give an example of this in a second so you can see how this works and how it's different to building features. Uh, at Multiverse, we set OKRs every quarter. Uh, we do it as a team activity because the team know the most about their domain, more so perhaps um, than anyone who they're working with. As ProdTech, we, uh, our product and technology team, we sit across our entire business and sometimes we can see links from different departments that other departments themselves don't see when they're sat in their own world, trying to do the best thing they can for their thing. They can't see uh, some of the efficiencies that you can get across departments. It's a little bit vague, so I'm going to give you an example and I'm going to turn the thing off for this. Um, so, and I'm also going to put my notes, but essentially, when I joined Multiverse, we have an early talent team, and that early talent team had a problem that they were having to spend hours and hours and hours trying to help candidates find the best roles for them, and also helping coach those candidates through the process. One of that was, hey, we need a lot of these roles are in person, and they need to be able to commute to an office. So, one of our team said, can we have a map functionality? We want maps. We want to be able to see exactly where every candidate is, where they live, and where the role is. And then we can scroll through the map, and we can do all this stuff. And my tech lead and I looked at each other and looked at the empty seat that should have had a product designer in it next to it that would have helped us build the best mapping experience we could possibly do. And then we looked at our own experience and the fact that neither has really had any experience building that kind of like beautiful reactive front end or dealing with spatial data in Postgres. And we also looked at all of the other problems that we wanted to solve to help this team. By setting an objective, which was to reduce the time on task rather than saying build the map thing, it allowed me and my tech lead and the other engineers on our team to go away and think about what could we do with the tools that we had to us. We already had a Google Maps API integration in the system, and we already had OBAN sat there. By combining that with the addresses of the candidates and the addresses of the roles, we were able to create an asynchronous job that ran every day to cache the commutes between candidates and jobs. In terms of API cost, it was about 30 quid, um, about 30 quid a month. It took us about an afternoon to do. And because of the amazing testing stuff that Oban has around it, the amazing UI stuff it has for operating in production with Oban Pro, which we've been supporting for a while, um, it meant that we had confidence, and that has been running uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of calculations efficiently while our CPU sits a little bit below 3% on one of the smallest uh, AWS instances. What we started with was, hey, give us this hugely complex mapping feature that's going to take you a couple of months to build. It's probably going to look crap because we haven't got a designer and neither does a particularly have a good eye for design. And what we ended up with was extending a small feature, and it solved all of the same impact that we had. And we can move on to the next problem. So that's the power of OKRs. It's also the power of data. You need to understand your users. When we're looking at OKRs, we have to understand, are we being successful? Those key results, whether that's user satisfaction, whether that's um, uh, the number of people who are doing signing up a day, 
Things like analysis on your database, we use a tool called Metabase, which we use with a read replica of our database so that we can get we can drive analytics uh, through that. We can uh, send Slack alerts of the number of people who are signing up every day. We can track where our peaks and troughs are with, with our stuff. We use Hotjar to get user feedback, and we have an amazing user research discipline that goes out ahead of us building stuff to make sure that we're working on the most impactful stuff that we can. Secondly, practice agile with a lowercase a. Where I was before at IBM, I was in tech consulting for my sins. Um, we used to sell Agile with a capital A. I was a licensed Scrum master. I was practicing safe and Scrum at scale and all these things. And it just didn't really work, if I'm honest. What we've been doing is just working on the most effective thing, breaking that work down into small chunks, and then delivering on those chunks. Uh, there's a good quote here from, uh, from uh, Bob C. Martin, who's the author of Clean Coder and Clean Architecture. He recently, I say recently, about two years ago, wrote a book called Clean Agile. And there's some amazing quotes in that. I would definitely, if anyone needs therapy around project management, <laughs> go and read that book. Uh, it's quite short. I read it on the tube and I get some funny looks. Some folks think that Agile is about going fast. It's not. Agile is about knowing as early as possible how screwed we are. The reason we want to know it is so we can then manage the solution. Next, measure your team's sentiment. We regularly have retrospectives, health checks that quantitatively check against key things, that how the team is feeling. Um, and then we can act on that. We can, we can really rapidly change things and change our strategy. Another thing is not shying away from delivery data. A lot of people have been scarred in the past by waterfall models, keeping track of things. Um, but in fact, delivery data, when you're breaking things small and working on the most important thing, your throughput is a great indicator that can help you predict whether or not future work that is big or small, whether you're going to be able to do it and set realistic expectations so that other teams can mitigate against it. Don't sugarcoat it when things look bad, because the only person who's going to suffer is you. If you plan early, you can solve it. And finally, Report on your uncertainties. I did a, a physics degree when, uh, when I was back at university, which I have not used much since, I've got to say. Um, again, an argument for apprenticeships. But this was a book that I had to buy in my first year of university called Measurements and Their Uncertainties. And it talks about the different ways that you can kind of measure the uncertainty in things. There's always uncertainty in our work. And while we might think something's big, we might also know exactly how to do it and how long it's going to take. We might have something that we think is small, but we're really not certain. That helps you not sugarcoat it when things look bad. So finishing up, because I think I'm running short on time. We were a small engineering team. We were growing, and we had the beginnings of an engineering management team um, with our hero, Theo. We're now a team of more than 60 engineers, ten, more than 10 teams. I say 10 plus because I think we're forming a new one today uh, as they split out. We are a cross-functional powerhouse of design, engineering, and product, and also data. We also have a leading engineering management team, 14 EMs, director of engineering, a VP, and an exciting new CPTO that I'm not sure I'm allowed to tell you about yet, but check back in on our LinkedIn page in future. The future of learning is working, um, and we're trying to make it happen. So thank you very much, first of all, to you for listening to me for the last 25 minutes, but secondly, to more generally you as the Elixir community for building this awesome stuff that allows us to do it and continuing to, to kind of uh, move us forward. Thank you. All right. All right, so before lunch, I got uh, some feedback that I was interjecting and asking too many questions. So I'm glad to see that somebody else is now going to go first. Um, hello. So you've mentioned that uh, you are practicing uh, hybrid working, both remote and on-site. How does it work for you? Because I've heard and I've read that some companies have the problem where people that are in the office uh, sometimes communicate with each other uh, outside of uh, chat apps. And how do you solve that issue of, of hybrid work? Yeah, sure. So the, the question is, um, how do we balance hybrid work and, um, and, and remote work and make it work together so that people aren't missing things who are in the office, is that correct? Um, yeah, it's a, really, it's a really tough one is the honest answer, right? And as you're growing, the space that you have in the office as well for remote collaboration, so things like Zoom rooms where you can get everybody in the room, um, 
you know, like it gets smaller and smaller as you get a bigger, and bigger team. We're going to a new office soon, which is going to make it a lot better. But I think it's about making that time, right? It's about making time as a team um, to have the remote first interactions as well as the the in person first interactions. We also have an expectation in those hybrid roles that like people do come in a few times a year for specific workshops or social events, the places where the big de- like we're making big decisions, that kind of thing. So people do come in. Um, so. Yeah, I think I think that it's it's those two things really. It's it's making space for those in person interactions when you can do. It's making sure that you know r- remote is the first the first standard, and office is the addition, rather than the other way around. And also just you know that question is like it's something that a lot of people ask us, and we ask it ourselves, and we acknowledge that it's something we have to mitigate and keep holding ourselves accountable to that to make sure that we are providing the best remote experience as well as the best office experience so that both both sides can get it. And again, it feeds back into that kind of reflect often, have those retrospectives. If people are feeling left out, then they should feel psychologically safe enough to tell you in those sessions or to tell their managers outside of that. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. You. All right, do we have more questions? No? Yeah, one more. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I'm curious about that thing about aligning on goals, not uh, not about the incentives or like you know requirements. Uh, I'm uh, curious how does it affect your like hiring process actually? Because you showed that that the circles which are like you know shrinking itself uh, much and much, and uh, I guess it's not that quite often approach to 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 form. Uh, product teams and to, to build about goals, about the intentions, about the business problems, not the requirements itself. And I'm curious how it's mm-hmm. like change your with the way you hire people. Yeah, yeah. Thank so you. the question is how does having that product focus around OKRs rather than requirements alter how we hire? The answer is we we try to optimize for people who are like driven by our mission rather than driven by necessarily the technology side of things or anything else in particular. The tool should be the tool we use because it's the best tool and that's why we use Elixir, right? Um, we should We should optimize for people who have that slight business mind, that slight curiosity, that interest in what we do for a living. Because at the end of the day, in that model where you give people objectives, key results, and then the creativity to go off with your design team and your user research team to see like, what should we bet on? What should we go for next? What's the next idea we want to try? How do we communicate that to the business? It's not sitting in a room as a feature factory, right? It's getting in there, getting into the weeds, having ideas and trying things and being willing to fail. And I think that's what we, that's how we optimize for in our hiring process is more that kind of stuff um, rather than people who are incredible technologists who are, you know, master's degrees in, in functional programming. Not that we won't take everybody that we can we can get who does have that background because we also have that need for principal engineers too, right? We have complicated systems, distributed systems, um, and we need to make sure that they're reliable and scalable uh, and secure as well. Does that answer your question? Thank you. All right, then I have a final question, I think. Uh, what was actually the, the hardest thing in, in these last two years? Um, I think... The hardest thing I would say is like going from 10 engineers to 60 uh, and bringing in people who are generalists who have like a wide variety of backgrounds and just making sure that there's space for everyone's voice to be heard um, and that we can make decisions effectively um, uh, that we get behind and move us forward. It's not been like a huge problem for us, right? But that model of going from 10 people being sat together on a floor in London to 60 people sat across the UK and making effective decisions that are, you know, scalable across that, where everybody's informed, everybody has the really, like kind of the ability to comment on on the direction, but still keeping us moving forward and building stuff. It's a really difficult balancing act, right? You've got to keep everybody happy, and sometimes you can't. It's kind of just a, a, a thing, but making sure that all of that works in progress, I think, I think in, in kind of in in parallel, that's that's a difficult thing to do. But I think we've done a pretty good job of it so far. All right. Thanks again. (laughs) Thank you.